Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 11, will you? And, and as I do, I was just reminded that I need to clarify, Matt is okay, Matt King, um, uh, I, I hope I didn't make you too nervous, but Matt is okay, he, he wasn't physically hurt in the accident, others were, so we just want to pray that God would just work that whole situation out, and he can get home, and all will be well. Acts chapter 11, so um, we're going back to this series, we started this series last fall, you might have remembered. Uh, we want to be a Jesus-centered, spirit-filled church. And the first half of, well, the first few chapters of Acts focuses on Peter, right, and the other disciples and, and what happened there with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then they started doing ministry and God, Acts chapter 2, they were ha- having some great ministry to one another. It was just, it's really awesome. Well, then in Acts chapter 7, I think it's at the end, where Stephen is getting stoned to death, right? Deacon Stephen is getting stoned introduced is this dude whose name is Saul. And Saul's name ends up being called Paul. So Saul, Paul, I'll probably call him Paul for most of today. Um, but So Paul's introduced, and Paul has the initial, if you've ever heard, boy, that person had a Damascus Road experience. The Apostle Paul, he's the original Damascus Road experience, right? He had the, he had the one, it's recorded in Acts chapter 9, and he went from persecuting Christians and new believers of the way, followers of Christ, he went from persecuting them to being one of them. And it, it, was, it was just a really amazing how God uh, brought him into salvation. And then the church at the time just kind of tucked him away in his hometown of Tarsus. Now, I got to show you a map. Uh, you know, I love my maps. So let's, let's pull up this map because I want you to see. Now, first, let me say I have no idea who Ralph Wilson at JoyfulHeart.com is. No idea who he is. But Ralph, thank you. If you happen to catch this, we're using your map. Good work. Um, <clears throat> so you go all the way to the top, and you'll see Tarsus. You see that? That's where the Apostle Paul's hanging out. Interesting that even though the Apostle Paul got saved, and he already was very learned and trained in Jewishness, in the Jewish faith, but he needed some time to really come into the Christian faith of, of what it means to accept Jesus as your Lord and your Messiah. And so they tucked him away up there in Tarsus for a season and for a time. And meanwhile, the persecution in Jerusalem began to grow. Now, whenever I see a map of the Middle East, I don't know about you, I'm sure you look at maps all the time of the Middle East, but when you do, I always like to see where's Jerusalem, where's Bethlehem, where's kind of that, that's kind of the main part of the New Testament, you know, so you got Jerusalem down here at the bottom, Judea, and uh, um, the uh, Dead Sea, so you got all that right there, so that's, that's in Jerusalem, people were getting saved and saved and born again. These are Jewish people that are coming into the knowledge of Christ as their Lord, their Savior, their Messiah, and ooh, this is great, but persecution was rising up, and so the church began to spread. In fact, leave the map up there. Let's just leave, leave the map, and, and I'm going to, you can follow along if you want to, in, in Acts chapter 11, verse 19 is where I'm going to read, and look on the map to see what I'm talking about. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in Jerusalem, in connection with Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia. Do you see Phoenicia? Um, like I said, it's right there on that, that, that general area right there. You see it. And then Cyprus and Antioch. So Cyprus is the island. So they're traveling Phoenicia, Cyprus, and then Antioch, Syria. Now, we're, we'll call the Antioch, Syria. I know you want to know this because there's two Antiochs. So this is Antioch, Syria. So it's just kind of a triangle of that area. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus, that little island thing, and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. So telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So, so when they went to Antioch, some of the guys was like, we're not just going to focus on the Jews, but we're going to share with anyone, Gentiles, Greeks, anyone. We're going to share the gospel with them. And all of a sudden, Antioch is having a revival. And so back in Jerusalem, they're hearing word. People are getting saved left and right up in Antioch. They're having a revival. They might have turned to each other, well, what's a revival? I don't know, but (laughs) someday we may call it this, I guess. Um, This is the New Testament church. They they were just setting the tone. There wasn't like a a guide to go by. They're setting the standard here. And so everyone's like, is this thing really real up in Antioch? So they send Barnabas up, and he ends up going and getting Paul from Tarsus. Barnabas went up and said, hey, this is legit. There are things, I can't believe I just used the word legit. 
That is sad. This is legitimate. I'm going to just say legitimate. And he goes over, grabs Paul, comes back, and they, they work with the leadership in that new young church to help establish that church. So they're in Antioch, and now flip your Bibles over a couple pages to chapter 13. Chapter 13, because this is where we catch up with the, the beef of our text today. Chapter 13, verse 1 in the church where at Antioch, in fact, you can put this passage on the screen if, you, if you'd like, there were prophets and teachers. Who, who was it? There was Barnabas. There was Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. It seems like a, a real interesting, just life-changing event encapsulated in about two or three sentences there. <laughs> Send these people up. This is what's called the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul went on three different missionary journeys. There's even a fourth one. I'm not sure we're going to get into that, but the three main ones, this is the first one. And what I want to talk to you about this week is the first one. Next week is the second one. And the third week of February, do you know which one I'm going to talk about? You guys are smart. You are with me. I'm talking about the third missionary journey on the third week this month. And then the last week, we're going to do faith missions promises, and I'm going to talk about missions still. But we want to talk this month, this whole month, about evangelism, about reaching out, about missions, about sending people to the ends of the earth to share with people the gospel. And that's exactly, this is the first time. This is the first time that they sent out missionaries on a major trip to go out and share the gospel. Well, where did they go? I know you're all just sitting there saying, well, if it's the first journey, I so wish that someone had a map that would help me understand where did Paul go in his first missionary journey? Ah, we're in luck. Check this out. Okay, so... Where were they at? Does everyone remember where Paul and Barnabas were? They were in Antioch, Syria, right here, Antioch, Syria. So they jump over here to the island of Cyprus. Well, actually, they went down to Seleucia, and then they, they, take a, they didn't jump. They didn't swim either. They took a boat over here to Cyprus, Salamis, Paphos. Um, there was some powerful ministry that happened there, and then they, they take a boat up here to Perga, the Bible says, in the area of Pamph Pamphylia, and they start making their way up to um, I think it's called P Pisidian Antioch. So you see the other Antioch up there? Okay. So they're hanging out in Antioch, the other Antioch, and they're ministering. In each one of these places, they're ministering and God's using them. Once they got to the Pisidian Antioch, the Antioch up there, Scripture says that some of the Jews got a little rabble-roused. they got to understand, these Jews were just, they were very religious, of course, and they had been taught their whole lives that the Messiah was going to come and save them and die for them, all that, the Messiah was going to come, but they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. So these were people that knew about God, but they didn't really know God through his son, Jesus Christ. These are people that were simply religious. You know, honestly, I think for people who think they know about God, I'm a good person, I've got enough of God, and, and they, but they don't really know Jesus, they're some of the hardest people to reach, because they don't see their need for Jesus. Why do you say that, Scott? Because if you've been around Pathway any length of time, you know that that's what's been my heart for 22 years, is people that live in this community, and live in this area, live in this region, and they know about God but they don't really know God through his son, Jesus Christ. And they've got a touch of God, but they've never been completely born again and saved. And I'm telling you, that's why God put Pathway Church here 22 years ago, and that continues to be our target on the wall. And so they're going to Antioch, and these Jews were upset. You're upset in the apple cart. Don't tell us that we're not spiritual. And, and so they get upset, and um, they, they uh, uh, pretty much ran them off, and, and so they end up um, going over to Iconium. So they're in Iconium. See where Iconium is under, in the area of Galatia there? So they're in Iconium, and while they're there, the missionaries um, uh, caught word that the unbelieving Jews and, uh, and uh, some of the Gentiles and some of the city leadership were planning on stoning them. 
don't know if anyone's ever, uh, uh, if words ever got to you that someone was going to stone you to death, <laughs> you know, we're not talking like, we're talking like stoning, just like we're talking pelting you with stones and rocks and dragging you out. So they're like, I think maybe we ought to leave. Not a bad idea. So they head to Lystra, and man, God, they were in Iconium for some time, and then they moved to, uh, to Lystra, and they're ministering there. And, um, and at the same time, some of the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came to Lystra, and they started stirring it up again. <laughs> and the resulting mob actually got a hold of, of the Apostle Paul. It's, it says in Scripture that they pelted him with rocks. They stoned him. To the point where they knocked, I mean, he was unconscious. They drug his body to the edge of town, the Bible says. And he obviously was knocked out. They thought he was dead. And the Bible says this in Acts chapter 14, verse 20. But after the disciples had gathered around him, I think this is another peculiar verse. Are we missing anything here? After the disciples had gathered around him. So imagine, here's Paul, dead, knocked out, unconscious, laying on the ground, and the church gathers around him. I just got a feeling we're missing something here. Because, I don't know, if you were stoned, um, knocked out, and I don't think I'd just be standing around there saying, well, what are we going to do now? I think they were praying. I'm just telling you. It's not in Scripture, but I think they were praying. And, and they gathered around, and he got up and went back into the city. Listen, it doesn't say there was a miracle, but I'm telling you, if you would have been stoned and drug out and you were knocked out, how many agree it would be a couple days at Goshen or Elkhart Hospital, huh? Um, Maybe taking us to Fort Wayne, South Bend, you know, get the big city hospitals, right? I mean, I don't know, but we'd be, we'd be somewhere for several days, several weeks. We, th- this is a miracle in this sentence right here. This is a supernatural move of God miracle as, as the Apostle Paul just gets up It's only a flesh wound (laughs) in the spirit. And he walks back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas leave for Derby. Can you go back to my map? Thank you, Aaron. They leave for Derby. Derby's over here. Um, This area of, of Derby and Lystra, just FYI, this is where Timothy lived. And this is where Timothy gave his life to Christ. Now, he had godly mother and grandmother, but it's understood that, in, do you know who Timothy is in the New Testament? There's two books that the Apostle Paul, two letters he wrote in First and Second Timothy. So Timothy gets saved here. It's a pretty uh, important place. And then when they're done here, they make their way. Now, the arrow that goes from Derby straight to Pam, Pamphylia in, in Perga, I think it's a little off, Harold. Oh, no, Harold, or whatever his name was, didn't make this one. But they, they made their way back through Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and then they came down and they're just going back to those churches that they had started and the elders and the people that had been saved, encouraging them, blessing them. And then they make their way all the way back to Antioch. And they're back. This took about 12 to 18 months. 12 to 18 months they're traveling. And so, um, uh, listen, I, I see it on some of your faces. You're like, Scott, could you talk more about this journey? And I'm like, well, let me just get to the important parts. Because um, some of you are like, why was it important for you? I just want you to see. Well, first off, when you, when you read the Bible, this isn't just like a storybook. This isn't something where God just is like, and here's a little fairy tale, and all was ended well. And then Tinkerbell jumped in and spread a little sprinkle, and all was good. No, this, this is like, this is real places that where like you go, and you can visit some of these cities still. This is real. It's the Apostle Paul's on, on that first missionary journey. Here's the question I want to raise to you. What can we learn from this? From this journey, what are some things we can pull out of this journey? Acts chapter 13 and 14. What can we learn, takeaways from Paul's first missionary journey as we think about our missions program here at church and our, our call to reach our own community? Well, let me just toss this out to you. In fact, grab the notes in front of you real quick. Can you grab the notes? Grab a pen and fill in the blanks. I know for some of you, you're like, uh, I was riveted by the map, Scott. Can we go back to the map? No, now we have notes. Grab the notes, fill in these blanks. First thing I want you to write down is this. The missionary call was divine in origin. The missionary call was divine in origin. You might remember chapter 13, they were in a prayer meeting. While they were worshiping the Lord, verse 2 of chapter 13, and, and they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
set apart from me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which they have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Note how their call started in a prayer meeting. I don't know as if this is prescriptive. I don't know as if, I'm not saying at all that the only way you can ever be called to be a missionary and to be a, a, a prophet or an evangelist or an apostle to go overseas is if you're in a prayer meeting. I'm not saying that. But there's something supernatural about the call of God. No man can call you to be a missionary. Now, I know most of you have no desire to be a missionary, but the fact of the matter is, I just wanted to clarify this as we look at this. This was a divine call. This was, this was the Holy Spirit moving. And in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it, it says this. It was he who gave some. Who's he? Jesus. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until the end. This is what I want you to get. There's not necessarily a, a church office, a ministry office called missionary, but I can tell you I think the, one of the closest things might be apostle. Um, might be an apostolic call where they go in where there's no ministry happening, where there's no church perhaps, or where the church is dead. They go in and they bring life. They go in and bring the gospel and they, they set it up. They establish it. Maybe there's an evangelist that comes in and does a really good job of sharing the gospel and they team up and they do this kind of thing. Th- this is what I want you to get. These offices that people move in and, and uh, call to missions, this isn't just because you enjoy living overseas. <laughs> Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Missionary. How did you get your missionary call? Well, I want to tell you. Have you ever wanted to live in Europe? I did. For many years, I, I really wanted to live in Europe. And then I thought, I'm going to live in Europe. Why not London? So I decided I was going to live in London. And one day on the playground, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me as a group of kids. I don't know what it was. I was saying, London Bridge is falling down. London Bridge is falling down. London Bridge is falling down. My fairly, and I felt God speak to me in that moment that I was to go to London and I would move to London. And then they said, and take the key and lock them up. Take the key and lock them up. Take the, and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me again. And I thought, if the devil's locking them up, I must go and present the gospel to London. And that's how I got to Piccadilly Circus in this flat, supported by some really generous Americans. <laughs> no. Now, if you want to live overseas, go for it. But that doesn't mean that you're called to be a missionary. So, so there's a divine call. I, I just want you to get this. We're not going to spend much time on this. But even as we look, we, I, we'll get you a half sheet list of all of our missionaries this month. All of those that we support on a regular monthly basis. And I'm not saying we're perfect or any of these missionaries are perfect. They don't all walk on water. Well, Chris might, but, uh, and, but and you walk on water. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we, we make sure, one of the things is we don't just want to support somebody who, who wants to go live overseas. We want someone who has the call of God to, to have that missionary call. The idea is this. Missionaries, go to where it is, wherever it is God has called you. Raise up the indigenous church, raise up indigenous people, work yourself out of a job so you can move on to somewhere else. You get it? The indigenous church principle, that's our heart, and it takes a divine call, and I think I've said enough about that, um, but I I, I wanted to say it anyhow. Number two, the second thing I would say is this, fill this in. Worshiping and fasting opens our ears to hear the Holy Spirit speak. If you haven't learned that yet, let me just encourage you, learn it today. Again, we go back to Acts chapter 13, and in those first couple of verses, you see they were worshiping, they were fasting, they were praying. I, I, I want you to notice something. You know, all of us, sometimes we struggle to really get that final kind of direction from God. God, what, I'm trying to hear your voice, trying to get direction. What, what is it you have for me here, there, whatever? And this isn't just a missionary call. Well, Scott, I'm not planning on going into full-time ministry, vocational ministry, so I think I'm good. No, every piece of your life, God wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He wants to speak to you. And you, you, sometimes that's overwhelming, right? Because the God of the universe who put the stars in the heaven, place that created all this, he wants to have a relationship with me. Hello, Jesus Christ, fully God yet fully man. God the Father sent his son to die on earth so that we could have a relationship with God. I mean, yeah, that's a, he's God incarnate, God with us. God so wants to have a communication with you, wants to have a relationship with you. Well, how can I put myself in a position to be able to hear from him? Well, I'll tell you, fast, pray, worship. 
There's something, and I think it's interesting because we've already talked a lot about fasting and praying already in January, but that, that third one, worship, you know the power of worship. You know, I, I, I'm just shoot straight with you because I love you. But I want to tell you something. God wants to take our worship to a new level. And I don't think it's going to take smoke. Man, if we just had a smoke machine, then the Holy Spirit could really move. If we had some more lights just going every which way, and all the cool Christian concerts have us. And no, listen, what we need is more of the presence and the power of Almighty God manifesting amongst us. And how does that happen? It happens when our heart is engaged in true worship. And I know for some of you, you're like, you grew up in a church where we barely opened our mouths. <laughs> You, or you didn't grow up in church, or you grew up in a church where it's, uh, Scott, this is so, the idea that, uh, that I'm going to, like, shout, or I'm going to even sing out loud, or talk out loud, or lift, express myself with hands. This isn't, this isn't Scott's way to worship. That's the thing you've got to get, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the expressive way that you see, it's what you see in Scripture. And so as we look at Scripture, the Scripture's the one that says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Scripture's the one that talks about lifting our voices, talks about lifting our hands, talks about lifting our heads, talks about bowing our heads, talks about bowing before the Lord. I mean, there's all kinds of ways, dancing before the Lord, all of these expressions of worship. And I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. If, if, okay, if this is where you're at, if this is where you're at today, okay, we're in our worship service, and you're just like, I'm, this is where I'm at, and I'm pretty comfortable here, Scott. And I might mouth the words. Can I just encourage you? Actually sing the words next Sunday. If you're singing the words and your eyes are, how about do just next, the next, just do this. Next Sunday, do this. Just say, God, okay, God, I'm just going to close my eyes, take out the distractions for a good chunk of the songs. I might have to open them a couple times to get the words, but I'm going to, oh, I'm just going to, God, I just want to worship you, so I'm just going to worship you. And if you're there, then can I encourage you? Maybe that next Sunday, do one of these. Just say, God. Um, I know it's in the Bible, so I'm going to go for it, and I'm going to sing out loud. I'm going to close my eyes at a time, and I'm going to just lift a hand of worship. And, and then if you're like, okay, you're, you're pretty comfortable, especially on certain songs and doing one of these things, can I just encourage you to lift up the other one then? And then at some point, if you're there, can I just encourage you? Just, just go for it. Just say, God, I love you. And if you're there, maybe just get a little pep in your step and say, God, I, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I know you're not comfortable. And I'm not even, listen, I'm not even asking you to go outside your comfort zone. I think this is something we really need to be clear on. I'm not asking you to go outside your comfort zone. I'm asking you just to worship biblically. I'm not talking about your comfort zone. I'm just encouraging you. Why would you say all that, Scott? I know why. You don't like the Mennonites. <laughs> and I was a Mennonite, and that's the way we were, and we liked it. No. I have plenty of, I mean, I have Mennonite blood in me, okay? So that's not it at all. It's, it's just that I want to see God move in this place. And I know the more hearts that are engaged in worship when we come together, worship isn't even just about Sunday mornings, though. And it's not even just a genre of Christian music. Worship is something we're meant to do every single day. Everything we do is meant to be worship unto the Lord. And I want you to notice that it was a prayer meeting, it was a fasting time, and there was also worship happening. When we worship, what it says to God is, come here right now. <laughs> it, uh, worship attracts his power, his presence. And I'm telling you, we have yet to see what God wants to do in this church. Uh, when, when, we, when we become even more of a worshiping church, I want to encourage you, go there. Um, and uh, that's about all I got to say about that. Let's move to number three. Number three, here it is, here it is. Their message was the gospel brought from the Old and the New Testaments. What was their message? When, when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas went from city to city to city to city to city, town to town to town, they got run off all those times, got stoned, got almost stoned. I mean, what was their message? Their message was the gospel. Well, what's the gospel? Well, I, I've got it in your notes, so you can see it on the screen here. It looks something like this. What is the gospel? The gospel is, broadly speaking, the whole of Scripture. So I think it's right if you say, uh, here's the gospel. It's the whole of Scripture. It's all of it. But even more narrowly, the gospel is the good news concerning Christ and the way of salvation. And so 
So the gospel is, is, part of the gospel could even be your testimony of how you were once a sinner, like all of us were, but you submitted your life to Christ, you repented of your sins, and God forgave you, and now you're born again. I mean, your story, along with the, the fact that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, and he rose again. The gospel message, the gospel story. What was it that changed people's lives? What was it that caused people to, um, to, uh, to just flock to these gatherings? There were times when they would go to the synagogues and they'd be ministering, and the next week they'd go back and the place would be packed. The whole town would show up. Why? Because the message of the gospel, the fact that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he rose again. He can forgive you of your sins. You don't have to live under religious bondage. You don't have to live under a list of do's and don'ts. No, we have a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ where I have freedom in Christ. Oh, yeah, there's some guidelines and some directions that he gives us in the word. We follow those. But I am set free from the bondage of sin, and I am set free from that religion. I'm, I'm born again. And this is the message that went forward. And I, I, I want you to hear me clearly. Yeah, let's feed the hungry. Let's clothe the naked. Let's give showers to those who need showers. <laughs> let's do it. But the ultimate goal, I know if Chris was up here, he'd say amen. The ultimate goal is not give them a shower. The ultimate goal is let me give you the gospel. Let me give you Jesus Christ. Let me point you to the fact that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and he's got a plan for your life. Have you found him? Have you repented of your sins? Josh uh, Havlin and Mandy are up here in the second row. Josh, he's a home missionary with the Assemblies of God. He goes into prisons. And he's in prison. Josh was in prison just recently. I just, poor fellow, I'm sorry to hear that. No, he, they always let him out, though. That's the good news. But he, they're going into the prisons. And what's the message? The message isn't self-help. The message is crucify yourself. And not, not, in, not, not like in a bad way, but like, like your, your spiritual man, just give your life completely over to Christ. Repent of your sins. Submit to God because he has a plan for your life. It's the same message for every person in this community and every, every place we go. It's Jesus Christ. And it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. They began their witness in the synagogues of, of the Jews. Do you know what they taught in the synagogues? Every single week, they opened up the scrolls, and it was the Old Testament. And so th they taught the Old Testament in these places, and then they came and they shared the, the, the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And I just want to drive this home, and I'm going to make a point in just a second. We'll move on to number four. But before we get there, Acts chapter 13, verse 16. Look at this, just real quick. I want you to see this. What did they talk about? They shared the gospel, but they shared the Old Testament and the New Testament. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers, Old Testament fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt, Old Testament. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about a about 40 years in the desert, he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, gave their land to his people as their inheritance. This is all Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. They brought the Old Testament. They brought the New Testament. Uh, why, why, is it, why do you make such a, a, a big point of this? Well, it's, it's because the, the past few years, I've seen a few loudmouth preachers step away from the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, even recently, I, I heard one of them say how in a conference just a few months ago that we need to pull away from particularly the Old Testament and just focus on the resurrection, the New Testament story of the resurrection. If I shared this dude's name, um, you probably might even know who I'm talking about, but at this point, I'm not going to. But I, I'm keeping an eye on it because I, I, I just think, it, to me, it's heresy to think that the Old Testament is not just as applicable to us today as the New Testament. Now, it's a different, it's a different uh, genre, uh, not genre. It's a different dispensation. I understand all this. It's, it's, it's different. But listen, when you look at the Old Testament, you can't help but to see there's a Redeemer coming. There's one who's coming to save you. You go, you go to Noah and the ark. Did you know that Noah was saved? His family was, um, was saved by God. They were put on that ark, and the ark could even be a, a future, uh, uh, just, a, a pro, just a thought of who Jesus was. As, as they got into the ark, they were saved. You think about Moses when his mama made that basket and placed Moses in that basket and put him in the, in the river, and it saved his life. How was Moses? Moses was saved out of that basket. It's a prototype. It's a thought of this. 
this is what's going to happen. Jesus is going to save us. You, you go to the, that, that, that one of the final plagues. Do you remember this? When they're coming out of Egypt. And what was it they put on the doorposts? The blood of the lamb. They put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes. And then the death angel passed over them. That's why they call it Passover. The death angel came through and said, oh, you got the blood of the lamb. You're saved. You're, you're free. So I'm just going to pass over you. Just take that right into the New Testament. When the precious, spotless lamb of God, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said, and Jesus dies on the cross, sheds his blood, the lamb of God. Don't tell me the Old Testament doesn't talk, isn't pertinent to us today. Don't tell me, Andy Stanley, to, okay, I said his name. Don't tell me, don't tell me that we need to walk away from the Old Testament because you walk away from the Old Testament, you walk away from some of the most powerful words that God ever wrote for our, up, for our discipleship. So they brought the Old Testament, they brought the New Testament, and they brought it so that these people could see the gospel. And they could understand who Jesus was. What was their message? Listen, as we affirm missionaries and outreach missionaries, this plays into our decisions. Because our goal is not just to take and give away money uh, and invest. I shouldn't say give away. We invest money in missions organizations just, just because they're doing something good. I, I want to just clarify. There are plenty of organizations, even in this community, that are doing good things. But if at the heart of what they're doing is not the gospel, we bless them. We might even just go and serve there and try to take Jesus into that. But if at the heart of what they're doing is not to see people one to Christ, taking the gospel message to them, then we, we say, God bless you. But it's probably not somewhere we're going to invest our missions money. Because the most important thing we could ever do is to give someone the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know you're with me on that, but that's, that's the heart of our missions program. Let's go to number four, the final one. Here it is. And this is a short one, I promise. Praying and giving partners enable missionary work to be accomplished. The church in Antioch, Syria, was where the believers gathered for worship and fasting. It was there that the believers felt the Holy Spirit was, were sending Paul and Barnabas out to, to minister I just want you to get this. In essence, the church in Antioch, Syria, was Paul and Barnabas' home church. I mean, in a sense, you get that feeling. They were sent out from that church. The Great Commission was given to the church, and the lesson for us is that the local churches and missionaries need to partner together for the work to move forward. Paul and Barnabas valued the local church and reported back to their local church about the work that had been accomplished. There should be no struggle between the local church and missionaries or missions agencies. It's the local church that ought to be sending out missionaries to train up others to start other local churches. When these missionaries are going out, whether it be from Pathway or whether it be in Acts chapter 13, they're going out to do what? They're going out to start more churches, to raise up leaders and to train, tr train uh, uh, leaders to start more churches and to lead these churches. But that's the whole pulse that's a that's a whole plan for a missionary the whole thing is work yourself out of a job raise up leaders and and so it's the local church that's the key to this whole thing if we just send missionaries to the dr if we just send missionaries to wherever else in slovakia and south africa tanzania wherever they're going germany it, if we just send missionaries over there and all they're doing is clothing people and feeding people and, and even schooling people, those are all great things. But the biggest, most important thing is are they bringing them the gospel? And the local church, is that's our call. It's the Great Commission. It's our call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so the local church is a sending agency. And then in, in Acts um, chapter 14, verse 27, it says this. When they came back on arriving there, they gathered the church together, reported all that God had done through them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there for a long time with the disciples. Scott, I, you know, uh, Pathway's a pretty good church, but, you know, I don't understand. Why every month does it seem like you have a missionary come through here? I mean, we get it. You take a whole month in February, and you talk about missions and events. Why every month do you do that? Because it seems like the biblical pattern. It's not a denomination. 
that sends out missionaries. It's a local church, and local churches send out our missionaries, and then those missionaries come back, and what do they do? They report, this is what happened. Come share in this. And that, that connection to the local church is absolutely pertinent. I mean, you can't get around it because we're, we should be praying for them. We should be giving sacrificially to send them. <laughs> and, and when they come back, we ought to be rejoicing with them, rejoicing as to see what God has done through their ministry, in their ministry, and give them a, a, like a holy high five and celebrate with them. You know, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth. We are absolutely committed here at Pathway to reach our Jerusalem. We're just as much absolutely committed to reach the ends of the earth. There's places in the world that have yet to get a clear gospel witness. And there's places like all, all of Europe almost where there once was a solid gospel witness, but it's fallen on deaf ears. And we've got to do something to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But uh, this, is, this is the way we say it, is we take it to the ends of our driveway and share the gospel, and we go to the ends of the earth. Both are equally important. And we as a church want to be a part of doing all of that. When we look at the, the, the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, this is what we see. And this is why, why we take a whole month and we talk about this. Let me just ask you.